everyone. So today we will explore the world of Jomon. Now, some of you may be wondering, what is Jomon? So first things first, let's talk about this. So the name Jomon consists of two Japanese characters, Jo and Mon. Uh, now, Jo means rope and Mon means uh, sentence, word and also decoration. Uh, so the word jomon is derived from the ropes that were used to decorate the quintessential characteristic artifact of the jomon period, which are the clay pots. So the ropes would be imprinted on wet clay and then made into intricate designs. Now, over the centuries and uh, the very, very long time that these uh, traditions were around, the pots also evolved and many other designs, uh, for example, intricate decorations at the tops that were reminiscent of flames or perhaps waves were also added. Now, Jomon is, as I mentioned, is a period of time and it's a period of time of, in Japanese prehistory that lasted from 16,000 years ago to about 2,300 years ago. Now, those of you who are aware of Jomon may be itching to tell me that I'm a few hundred years off, uh, but let me just say that, um, of course, uh, the start of the end of Jomon period was actually 2,500 years ago, but it took some time to sweep across all of Japan, and in Niigata, in some of the northern, more northern prefectures, or what is now northern prefectures, uh, the change happened 2,300 years ago. Uh, now, the end of the uh, Jomon period is traditionally marked by the beginning of agriculture around the, uh, the modern-day Japan. During the Jomon era, people largely subsided off of uh, hunting, fishing, and of course, gathering. And uh, although some scientists believe that they were aware of agriculture happening in other countries, like for example, China and Korea, which were actually pretty close to, uh, well, J Japan at the time. They were not yet making the switch and it took them as a very long time to actually start doing the agriculture. Some aspects of the lifestyle from the time are still practiced today. So, let's explore. Even these days, living in Niigata is not easy because in winter there's sometimes three or four meter snowfalls. And actually in the Jomon period, or at least in the middle Jomon period, they think that the weather and the climate conditions are about the same. So, as you can see in from this house here, uh, some accommodations to the weather had to be made. Uh, for example, as you can see, the house consists of a 5 meter pit that is actually about 50 centimeters buried into the ground. This was done for, uh, well, heat preservation purposes and uh, because uh, the winds were also very uh, strong and, of course, very um, lots of snow. Another thing that was uh, also adaptation for snow are the very thick pillars that supported the whole house. Uh, these pillars were made from chestnuts and uh, be for many reasons. One reason being that the sturdy wood could actually support the weight of the snow. And another reason would be that perhaps villages were made near chestnut woods because uh, chestnuts were incredibly important food source in, uh, well, all seasons. Uh, so another uh, would be the whole layout of the house as well. As you see, the fire pit is in the middle of the floor. Uh, this was used, of course, for cooking, but also for heat. Uh, the fire was incredibly important and always maintained, and I, very likely that they would try to keep it going, especially in winter, even in the night. Uh, people would sleep on furs, animal furs, that they, would that they had hunted that would be laid down around the fire uh, for heat as well and probably also to preserve the fire as well because I mean, if it goes out, that's bad for everybody. So this is also the time when animals start to become domesticated, particularly dogs were the first to be domesticated. And it is very likely that there were many reasons for this. One reason is perhaps warmth 
because the dog is very warm and it, you know you can hug it and another reason is that they're incredible he helpers when hunting and in winter when there were not that much uh, plants to gather or fish to fish, hunting was the main form of sustenance. At the time, hunting was done using a bow and arrow. This was no easy craft. Regardless of weather, the Jomon people went out of their homes to hunt. In the autumn, uh, animals would also build a very thick layer of fat, so it would make them especially delicious. Now in Niigata, the main hunting animal, the animal that was hunted mainly are deer, as you can see in this installation, and also boars. So it was a very important for the people at the time of the Jomon period, as in many other cultures, to use every part of the animal. So furs, for example, were used for clothing and also for heat. And additionally, uh, bones were used for arrows. Of course, the tips are usually made of stone, but the fittings were made of bone. And then also, of course, accessories. Many, many accessories were uh, consisting of, for example, teeth or maybe antlers or sometimes even whole jaws. So accessories were incredibly important to the people of uh, Jomon period. They would use m m a variety of things. For example, they would use shells, acorns or other nuts or perhaps chestnuts as well. They would of course use wood and one thing that was very interesting, they also used stone. The most popular stone accessory was the magatama. This was an embryo-shaped pendant made by polishing pieces of stone or glass or even wood. The meaning of Magatama is unclear, but perhaps it was believed to bring luck. These days, people use soft soapstone to make their own personal Magatama amulets. Accessories were so important that actually uh, they are one of the best proofs we have that there was trade happening amongst different tribes. For example, jade that is found in Niigata Prefecture, in Itoegawa in Niigata Prefecture, is also found in Hokkaido and, and as far uh, as Okinawa as well. So that's thousands of kilometers in either direction and the only reason for the jade to get there in the quantities that it's being found is to actually be traded for something, for other, some other goods. And even to these days, uh, jade is still found. Of course, <laughs> it might not be as that easy to find something of this size, but people who look for jade professionally, they can maybe find one of these in an hour. And there are several ways to tell jade apart from everything else. You can see this stone is very smooth because it's very, very hard, very smooth. Yes. And this is another way to tell. As you see, despite being incredibly, incredibly thick and hard, this is how jade reacts to light. Uh, so jade was an incredibly, incredibly important stone, perhaps because it seems that it was traded very far and very wide. And for many qualities, uh, it, as well as the color, the very natural green color. Uh, well, that's about jade. So we've actually naturally moved into spring right about now. Uh, with the snow melting, different uh, plants start to emerge and it, people would come out, J the Jomon people would come out and they would gather all of these plants, all of these different varieties. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, to most Japanese children, all of the plants on display here are incredibly familiar. All, well, at least, Niigata children, I, w I would not be presumed to speak for other prefectures and other places in Japan. Uh, but it is very remarkable that even these days, people go out in the spring and they gather almost the same vegetables as they did through in the Jomon era. Uh, it is actually incredibly uh, annoying sometimes when you're driving in spring and you see a seemingly abandoned car by the side of the road and then looking closely, you kind of can see a grandma somewhere off in the mountain, you know, picking, up, picking the vegetables uh, to bring home. And, you know, you kind of wonder a little bit uh, if, um, you know, you should be eating something that you found on the side of the road. 
but in, I also had a very limited experience this year of going uh, vegetable picking or sansai picking, as they call, uh, sansai as they refer them in Japanese, which is uh, mountain vegetables. And I realized that the knowledge and is incredibly important when you're choosing which plants to pick. So as depicted here, uh, children from a very young age would probably be involved in the picking because with the good and delicious and very uh, healthy vegetables, there are also, right on the same spot, there are also poisonous vegetables that, I mean, one drop of which could perhaps even bring down a bear, never mind a human. And uh, people would have to be able to recognize these very, very quickly. So for example, as you see right in the back there, there's wolf's bane, which looks edible. However, it is not meant to be eaten at all. So interestingly enough, when we consider the dangers of living during the Jomon period, we also need to keep in mind that uh, in the Jomon era, injury was actually not a death sentence. So very many bodies are found with bones that have ev evidence of having been mended during life, and then the person continued to live for many, many years. Uh, in general, actually, burial practices during the Jomon period were quite interesting. So when a person would pass away, they would be buried, probably somewhere within the village even, and then after some time had passed, they would be reburied, sometimes into clay pots, sometimes into just another burial. After that, you know, that's where their final resting place would be. These reburial practices, interestingly enough, were actually present in some cultures, or sorry, in some areas of Japan until the 19th century when they had been outlawed. But relatively speaking, until very, very recently, the Jomon burial practices were also present in uh, Japan. And another thing that bodies from the Jomon era could teach us about their culture is also quite interesting. So it seems that as a rite of passage and the coming of age, certain teeth would actually be pulled forcefully. Which teeth were pulled would actually depend on the area in the village that uh, the person was living in. So looking at the mouth of somebody, you could not only tell what age they were, or rather if they had come of age or not, but also the village and the area that they were from. I do think that regardless of which teeth were pulled, it was probably an excruciatingly painful thing to go through. But you know, different coming of age ceremonies are different in many areas. So let's talk about the summer uh, sustenance. So in the summer, as you see, fishing was one of the main things that, uh, where food would come from. Um, actually, despite the image of summer being, you know, warm and bountiful and uh, plentiful, it was probably one of the less b bountiful times of the year because the vegetables that were so abundant in the spring have already likely, uh, well, have already grown up so they're unable to eat them anymore. But uh, different plants that get ripe in the autumn are still not ready. So fish and also shellfish were eaten very, very often. And also seaweed as well was probably a big part of the diet of the Jomon people. I think the fishing practices were also incredibly interesting. So if you look up there, so as you see at the top of the cliff, a lookout would sit and look over the sea. He would look over the sea and look for clusters of birds. The clusters of birds would indicate uh, that fish were under those birds. And then uh, the fishermen that were waiting on the, on the shore would get into their wooden boats and they would race across to presumably catch the fish. At the time, hooks were still not really used. Fish was usually speared using long and thin spears or also fish were caught in nets in a more kind of bulk way, I suppose. 
So the fish that was caught, um, it was important to, you know, well, of course it was eaten right away, but it was also important to create something that would last in the other seasons as well. So the fish would likely be gutted right on the shore and then salted and dried or maybe smoked as well and uh, various kind of forms of preservation. Uh, the shellfish was likely boiled and uh, this is what we see here. Oh, and the uh, seaweed would be dried as well and then eaten that way. So the preservation of food would start in the summer with the fish and would really, really kick into gear uh, for winter. So things like nuts and mushrooms and uh, uh, chestnuts, which I guess are a kind of nuts, they would all be gathered together and uh, they would be prepared for winter and prepared to last through the winter. Uh, interestingly enough, some people believe that uh, the pottery that was used in the Jomon era period, especially, you know, the late Jomon period, which with the intricate designs at the top, is one of the most difficult pots to actually use. One of the theories of why they made these intricate decorations is as a kind of commemoration of the magical thing that these pots did. So the pots took things that were inedible or that made you sick when you ate them. And after a very short, you know, boiling and preparation time, they would actually make those things not only edible, but also last through the winter. And thus, uh, these pots were decorated for their magical abilities with various intricate designs. So another fun fact about these flame-shaped pottery designs is that in Niigata the designs are considered the most intricate. Now was this because of the very long winter hours that uh, the Jomon people could spend making the designs and planning them out? Or was it because the magical powers of food preparation and preservation that these pots offered were that much more important to survival in the very, very harsh winter conditions. I guess we'll never know.